Dr. Curtis and his team for putting this together this morning. I'm always much appreciated. Um, Dr. Curtis uh, is uh, my friend and colleague at Sunnybrook Hospital, and he, he majored in macular biology at Princeton, so we always knew he was a genius. Uh, he went to McGill for medical school and then did, did a residency in ophthalmology at the University of Ottawa, followed by his fellowship in vitreoretinal retinal surgery with Dr. Golan Payman at Louisiana State University in New Orleans. And I know the name Dr. Golan Payman because he actually is famous as uh, one of the inventors of LASIK, as well as being a retina specialist. Uh, so Peter <clears throat> practiced in Ottawa for six years, coming to Toronto in uh, Sunnybrook at 2003. And uh, he's on staff uh, both at Sunnybrook and Sick Kids. And of course, he was, was our ophthalmologist in chief until just uh, a few months ago. He has an interest in clinical epidemiology and evidence-based medicine, and has published three books on the major trials in ophthalmology, and served as one of the editors-in-chief of the journal Evidence-Based Ophthalmology. Many chapters and many peer-reviewed publications. Also, a special interest in international ophthalmology and has participated in over 25 volunteer projects throughout the developing world, many of them focused on retinopathy and prematurity and pediatric retina, some of which we're gonna learn more about today. So thank you very much, Peter, for joining us with your team, and uh, we can begin. Thanks, John. Um, when, I, um, when I was asked to do these rounds, I thought, you know, you know, there, I, having seen lots of grand rounds, I thought, you know, rounds can go one of two ways. Usually, you know, there are lots of um, great rounds where, um, you know, subspecialists or comprehensive ophthalmologists will attack a problem that, you know, many of us will see in our practices and, you know, don't have a, a great handle on and they're very practical and very useful. And then there, the other, the other camp is kind of the, um, it's kind of fringe ophthalmology, kind of the crazy stuff that goes on at the fringes of ophthalmology. And, you know, to be honest, um, I kind of like the fringe um, grand rounds better than the practical ones. So, um, so I chose a fringe rounds today and SickKids is very much a fringe, is it very much a, a place that practices on the fringes of ophthalmology. We see a lot of um, crazy stuff. There's not, it's, ne it's never really mundane there. And you'll see from the four cases that we chose to talk about um, today, they often involve, you know, several groups of sub sub specialists and uh, in the care of these very complicated pediatric patients where the stakes are high and, um, and they're always um, a challenge. So um, we have four very diverse um, cases today and I, I wanted to, I wanted to focus on, you know, the surgical retina elements. Um, so, you know, no self-respecting retina surgeon would give a presentation without showing at least some video. So we have, a, we have some interesting videos and um, we're gonna start with Weiwei. So Weiwei, most of you will know and remember was a fellow with us. And um, this year she's done an extra year in pediatric um, retina and inherited retinal diseases. And she's gonna, she's gonna give us our first case. So go ahead, Weiwei. Okay, I'm going to share my slides here. Um, so good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to start off um, this morning's grand rounds by sharing two um, very interesting cases. So as we know, retinoblastoma um, is the most common ocular malignancy in children. And um, management of retinoblastoma remains um, complex and in constant evolution. There's always a debate going on about whether to enucleate or versus um, attempt to globe salvage. And with advancement in newer um, therapies, the management options include systemic, intraarterial, intravitreal, and periocular chemotherapy. And they're all aimed at increasing um, globe salvage rates without higher rates of metastasis. Um, unfortunately, despite combinations of therapies, sometimes um, refractory and recurrence of tumor remains common. So I remember clearly as a resident, we have always been taught that unplanned um, vitrectomy um, it's, um, increases, carries the risk of increased um, extraocular extension and metastasis and is like a taboo, like a no-no. But um, with evolving use of intravitreal chemotherapy now, um, that has kind of revolutionized treatment in retinoblastoma. And 
Now we have moved on and um, planned vitrectomy with fragmentation of intraocular tumor with constant, um, I mean, continuous um, infusion of chemotherapy has kind of, um, it's an emerging technique now and it's aimed to um, eye salvage and to treat ocular complications, for example, vitreous hemorrhage or retinal detachments associated with retinoblastoma. Um, having said that, um, keep in mind that potential iatrogenic tumor spread remains in these cases. So we're going to share today our initial experience in two patients uh, with ret refractory and recurrent retinoblastoma after multiple sessions of systemic and ocular treatment. So the first one is a four-year-old boy with bilateral or original blastoma diagnosed in 2017 with left eye annucleated in 2017. And it has, been, um, under, has undergone multiple sessions of systemic chemotherapy with ocular treatments. And they were referred to us um, by the RB team um, with the concern that there is a worsening diffuse posterior lens opacity. As you can see here, um, he has some lens opacity um, uh, on the posterior capsule. And also there is a, oh, let me just close this. Hemorrhage on the posterior pole calcification with diffuse um, fundus view uh, due to vitreous hemorrhage. The pre-op vision at that time was 2640. So he subsequently, oops, sorry. He subsequently underwent a right posterior capsulotomy, vitrectomy and fragmentation of a tumor recurrence June last year. And I'm gonna share a, a short video clip on this. So we perform a standard three pots, 23 gauge vitrectomy with continuous mephalan infusion in the BSS. We started off by cleaning the posterior capsule and performing a po po posterior capsulotomy, as you can see here. And then we started our vitrectomy. It's a previously vitrectomized eye for vitreous hemorrhage, but there's a lot of um, tumor seedings. We, we started off by aspirating the tumor seedings And then we diatomize the vascular component on the tumor bulb itself to control the bleeding. And subsequently, we perform endolaser around surrounding the tumor bed. As you can see, this is the tumor bulb here. Calcified tumor with um, hemorrhage. And after endolaser is performed, um, we gently um, remove the soft tumor with a endo uh, with a vitrector, and then slowly mobilize, attempt to mobilize the tumor bulk and separate it from the from the base. And the tumor is um, now separated. And then this is obviously a um, fast forwarded um, video because the calcified tumor bulb is really hard and it takes a while to remove it and we have to fragment it with a fragmatome. Well, that's what we use with drop lenses as well. Um, so it's really, um, it's, it can be quite a, <laughs> it really is mm -hmm. much, really takes much longer and um, to, to break up that tumor with ultrasound. And then we aspirated the residual vitreous and also tumor. And clean up as much as we can. You can see there's still some residual vitreous, even after, even though this is a child's second vitrectomy. These kids have very form vitreous that can be hard to uh, to get out. Mm -hmm. And the rest of the tumor and visible choroidal invasion were resected. Oops, sorry. <laughs> That was the actual background music. And then we also perform um, laser over the tumor base.
just gonna maybe follow this a little bit. And then we end the surgery with the air fluid exchange. So um, this is the picture of the patient uh, post-op two weeks and the vision improved from 2640 to 2160. And father did mention that um, this is the clearest he has ever seen. And as you can see here, the media is clear and this is the lens and there is no, uh, I mean, obviously the posterior capsular opacity is gone. Post up two weeks and his vision improved further uh, post up six weeks to 21, 25. And just to show here, the IVFA perform at six weeks, there are no signs of um, recurrence. So this boy did really well. Um, I will now go on to the second case. Let me just turn this on here. So the second case is a four, another four-year-old boy, but with unilateral retinoblastoma. So he has a normal right eye and the left eye has a group D retinoblastoma. So similarly, he underwent multiple sessions of systemic and intraocular um, and also ocular treatment. And this is how he looks like before the surgery, really active looking um, area uh, at an inferior part of the calcified macular tumor. As you can see here, it's pretty vascularized. And this is the whole calcified uh, macular tumor. And this is um, IVFA showing a very vascularized tumor. Um, he underwent a left eye vitrectomy with FRAC um, in September last year. I'm gonna share uh, another video here. This is gonna be a shorter one. So similarly, three pots, um, 23 gauge vitrectomy and the continuous mephalon infusion. So this is his first surgery. We're just removing the vitreous here. We're trying to remove as much features as we, pos uh, as we possibly can. And then we proceeded with uh, endoresection of the soft tumor as much as we can with the vitreous cutter. The whole bulk is actually quite calcified. So subsequently we uh, as well need the uh, phragmatome to remove the tumor bulk. So we gently uh, similarly try to mobilize the tumor from the bed. And then the soft tumor over the base is resected with the vitreous uh, cutter. And I'm gonna fast forward this again, calcified tumor bulk, which is fragmented. This went on for, I don't know how long, it was long. And three, I think we went through three bottles of BSS. Yeah, with mephalon infusion. Yeah. And then retinal break was noted at the border uh, with subretinal fluid. Um, and no other breaks noted uh, on 360 scleral depression. We then perform a air fluid exchange. Oh, the retinal break was marked first with endodiatomy and we perform an air fluid exchange. And subsequently laser is performed over um, the retinal breaks and and over the tumor based. And then we did a C3 effort exchange uh, and the sclerotomy wound was sutured and cryotherapy performed over um, the edge of the tumor. And so this is how he looks like post-op one month. Um, this is the base of the tumor and the whole tumor bulk is gone. And this is the IVFA similarly showing no signs of recurrence. So I think there are more and more evidence now that uh, plant vitrectomy and fragmentation may have a role um, in, um, as, a, as a treatment option in very selected cases of retinoblastoma. So I would like to share a few papers here. Um, Zhao et al. Um, published a, a series of 21 eyes with mean follow-up of 3.3 years from vitrectomy and shows that there is 90% um, globe salvage rate with no extraocular metastasis with 78% functional vision. And three years later, um, you et al. Um, published um, another paper just recently, actually 2020, 11 eyes with mean follow-up of 42 months with globe salvage of 100% with no extraocular or remote meds and 90% improvement in, in vision. 
And subsequently, Zhao as well presented a larger cohort, actually a very large cohort of 225 patients treated uh, with vitrectomy for retinoblastoma. And their primary outcome was to look at the survival rate uh, related to the eye that received the vitrectomy and a couple of uh, secondary outcomes. And from their study, they found that the five-year survival rate, actually vitrectomy eye-related survival was 96%, which is really high, and an overall survival rate of 94%. And the RSI which, uh, rate following vitrectomy was 80%. And vision-wise, um, we always um, talk about survive, um, eye salvage and the vision is kind of secondary in this group D, um, group D retinoblastoma. But in this study, they show that eye that require complete retract, uh, retinectomy, one third of them has NLP, but with eyes with partial or no retinectomy, 60% avoided complete blindness and 19% avoided legal blindness, meaning that the vision was 2200 and better. So in conclusion, vitrectomy, um, reduces chemotherapy resistance by direct excision of the tumor and it manages some um, vision limiting complication associated with retinoblastoma, like vitreous hemorrhage and retinal uh, detachment. Um, I feel that um, um, vitrectomy um, plays a role in um, treating children with retinoblastoma in saving previously unsalvageable uh, eye. But um, having said that, uh, we have to stress here that retinoblastoma, uh, vitrectomy in retinoblastoma is limited um, uh, for very selected cases and only reserved for patients where refractory and recurrence happens despite um, treatments, conventional treatments um, and it should be done under control um, plan situation. And uh, with that, I, I thank you. Anyway, that was, uh, that was great. Um, thank you. In the chat, I know Brenda and Elise had, uh, had uh, some comments. Brenda, do you wanna, do you wanna go first? Um, yes, um, thank you very much. That was nicely presented. I'd just like to say that the uh, first patient has, uh, is doing exceedingly well, and this was the final step to remove the calcium that had tumor recurrence coming out of it. The uh, uh, second patient, the vitrectomy uh, left a bare, that left bare choride, and we've never resected metastatic choroid, that would be total no-no in retinoblastoma. The patient should have the eye enucleated if there was metastasis to choroid identified. But the, the recurrent tumor coming in the calcium um, was not possible to control but, except by removing the calcium. And that was um, very useful because when the recurrence came on top of choroid, then we realized the recurrence was out of control and we enucleated that eye. So the second eye was enucleated and leaving high risk features on pathology resulting in the child being correctly treated with adjuvant chemotherapy and probably a good result. Um, but I'd just like to say on the, um, the Xiao paper for the 225 patients with um, 245 eyes treated with vitrectomy, that paper, is not yet in press because the, we've multiply submitted it and the reviewers, half of them say, this is terrible. You can't possibly do this. It's too risky. And half of them say, this is um, gonna change the whole field. It's, it's, it's fantastic. And then the editors always come in and say, well, it's not a randomized clinical trial, so we can't publish it. So it's a very frustrating oh, way yeah. the uh, medical literature is reviewed and moved forward because it's quite a beautiful paper, yes. It will get published sometime, yes. <laughs> yeah, quite the series. Congratulations on that. Yeah, it's a well-written paper. And what, uh, we're, um, we're getting short on time unless Ashwin or Elise or Hugh have something burning to say. Why don't we move on to Hatem's case? It's another uh, pediatric oncology case. Do you wanna uh, start sharing Hatem? Yes, sure. I'm just sharing my slide now. <laughs> Can you see my slide? Yeah, we see it. Okay, so good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Hatim. I'm one of the Visual Eye residents. And uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Curtis for uh, sharing this uh, interesting case. 
a seven-year-old girl presented with left lazy eye as noted by her family for the past six months. Past ocular history was unremarkable. Past medical history was significant for acute lymphoblastic leukemia. She was diagnosed at age of three and was treated with uh, chemotherapy. Then she developed a CNS relapse at age of six and treated with intrathecal chemotherapy. And she has not received radiotherapy yet. On examination, uh, her vision in the right eye was 20-20 and in the left eye was counting finger. Slit lab examination was normal in both eyes. Fundus exam in the right eye showed two small pigmented spots in the macula, likely RPH changes and hyperplasia, otherwise normal exam. In the left eye, Fendes exam showed large whitish yellowish elevated subretinal lesion in the posterior pool that infiltrating optic nerve head and the uh, prepapillary retina with some abnormal blood vessels, retinal hemorrhages, and hard exudates. So based on this clinical presentation, our provisional diagnosis was leukemic optic nerve and retina infiltration. A patient was seen by her oncologist and urgent workup was done. And as you see here, both the diagnostic LP and bone marrow biopsy were negative for relapse. However, the MRI brain and orbit showed a new six millimeter left retinal mass with left optic nerve sheet fluid and no other CNS abnormalities. So after we discussed with her oncology, the challenging question was what we should do next. Should we start chemotherapy and radiotherapy assuming it's a leukemic infiltration or should we do diagnostic vitrectomy with vitreous sampling only or combine that with retinal or optic nerve biopsy? So at the beginning, we thought that we did not need to do the biopsy to know that this was leukemic infiltration, but her oncology team wanted the biopsy done urgently within one week because that had a significant implications on her treatment plan and prognosis, including the decision to go on to bone marrow transplant or not. And after a long discussion with her family and her oncologist, the decision was made to proceed with diagnostic vitrectomy with the retinal biopsy, although there was a high risk of permanent vision loss in this kind of procedure, but confirming the diagnosis was crucial for her treatment plan and diagnosis and prognosis as well. So now I'm going to uh, show you the uh, procedure that done by Dr. Curtis. So it's interesting, you know, we had, um, you know, we really um, didn't feel that this was a diagnostic dilemma. We could have, we knew very clearly that this was leukemia, but it really, as Hatem pointed out, it really made a big difference in terms of how they were going to proceed with treatment. So here, uh, here's a surgery. So that, that white stuff is not tumor seeding, but it's trimcinolone to help us see the vitreous, to help us get a posterior vitreous detachment. And so we picked a site for um, the retinal biopsy. So we're diathermizing around the kind of square of retina that we're gonna take out. And it, it's kind of important in these situations to try and, um, and make sure you get some normal retina as well to help the pathologist ascertain um, uh, normal from abnormal retina. And it's interesting at this point in the, um, in the surgery, it became clear that she had this kind of slurry of stuff underneath the retina. So we actually, we actually aspirated that, that stuff under the retina and sent it uh, and collected it in a 3cc syringe and sent that um, uh, separately to pathology for evaluation. And you could see from that quick flash that it was positive. I think Hatem has the pathology reports coming up soon. So we have this block <laughs> of normal and abnormal retina that we removed from the eye um, and sent to pathology. And, um, you can see this too is positive with uh, positive for a leukemic infiltrate. Um, and so we do an air fluid exchange and we laser around uh, um, we laser around that um, that biopsy site that um, where the retina is missing, and we filled the eye with a long-acting gas tamponade to make sure the retina stayed attached. 
Okay, and again, as you see here, the biopsy result uh, showed uh, for the subretinal fluid sample, early precursor B lympho uh, blast, and for the uh, retina sample showed uh, malignant pre B cell lympho blast that infiltrate, infiltrating the uh, retina. So based on this result, the, uh, she was diagnosed with a new isolated second CNS relapse that presented as isolated leukemic optic nerve and retina infiltration. After that patient was treated with systemic chemotherapy and radiotherapy, then she underwent bone marrow transplantation. Now she's doing fine. Her vision is hand motion and she developed cataract, but the intraocular infiltration has regressed based on Fendus exam and MRI imaging. And the unique thing about our case was the isolated leukemic optic nerve and retinal infiltration. This clinical presentation of the isolated intraocular relapse is very rare and has been reported previously in the uh, literature. And here, just a quick overview of the intraocular acute lymphoplastic leukemia relapse. As you know, AAL survival rates are very high in children. And most common sites for relapses are bone marrow and CNS. Isolated intraocular relapse is very rare, about 2%. And the most common affected uh, intraocular site is the choroid. Involvement of the optic nerve, retina, and vitreous is very rare and usually can be diagnosed clinically, but may require diagnostic biopsy for confirmation. And patient can be treated with combined chemotherapy and radiotherapy. And this is a recent retrospective study. They described a series of 11 eyes with intraocular leukemia that were treated with repeated intravitreal methotrexate injections. And they suggested that intravitreal methotrexate injection may be considered as an adjunctive treatment method combined with chemotherapy treatment. And finally, the take home message is relapse of acute leukemia may present as an isolated leukemic optic nerve or retinal infiltration. Biopsy could be considered in patient with leukemic intraocular infiltration with severe vision loss and inconclusive preliminary testing. And thank you. Thanks, Hatem. That was, uh, that was terrific. I, I wish we had some follow up um, photos to show you. This girl came from London. So, um, so unfortunately, They've been resistant to coming back. She had her bone marrow transplant at Sick Kids, but even when she was uh, in hospital for a bone marrow transplant, it was uh, it was difficult to see her and follow up because they're um, they they stay so isolated and and protected. So wish we had some follow up photos to um, to show you. Um, that's great. I, if anyone has any if if no one has any questions, maybe we'll move on to the next. Uh, presentation. So Paul's going to give the next one. This is an example of a young boy who uh, we've collaborated with our inheritable, inherited retinal disease colleagues um, at Sick Kids, a boy um, with X-linked retinoschisis. So why don't you take it away, Paul? It may be on mute. Um, so let's get this back on. Good. Can you see the slides okay? Yeah, we see them great. Perfect. So in the interest of time, I'll get right into things. Um, so the initial presentation for this child um, presented in infancy at 11 months of age and was referred to sick kids for uh, bilateral retinal detachment after the parents had noted an esotropia for a few months, but otherwise normal visual behavior. Uh, the anterior segment exam was unremarkable. The posterior segment exam is presented here. So um, we know the diagnosis already. This is a, an atypical presentation with very bullous retinoschisis with apparent folds in the macula at a young age. Uh, so initially this child was um, started on a carbonic and hydrase inhibitor and it followed relatively closely. Uh, genetic testing was done, which confirmed an RS1 mutation and amblyopia management with patching and later uh, refractive correction for hyperopic refractive error. Now, remarkably, um, over a few months to a year, the, the bullous cavities resolved um, quite impressively. And we can see on the photo here that there's residual fold through the macula, but the remainder of the, the bullous portion of the schesis resolved. And this child was followed for many years uh, and remained quite stable. 
Um, so we started seeing him at 11 months of age. And then at nine years of age, he presented with uh, these findings in his left eye. Relatively asymptomatic, this was at a routine visit, though he did note some floaters on specific questioning. So we can see some localized vitreous hemorrhage along the superior arcade and inferior, and this residual fold through the temporal macula, but the, the retina otherwise looked relatively stable despite the hemorrhage. So it was followed closely. However, subsequently developed um, a macula involving retinal detachment in the left eye. The interesting thing here is it seemed to be predominantly of a tractional nature. So we can see the vitreous hemorrhage this fold and some pre-retinal perforation related to the fold and no breaks were evident. Um, so just taking a step back uh, to review some things regarding excellent retinoschisis. So there tends to be a bimodal presentation either in infancy or school age children. And important to highlight there's quite significant phenotypic variation. So some, some, ch some children can have quite good vision and some uh, a little bit worse. Now the prevalence itself uh, is relatively rare but I think it's worth highlighting that uh, hereditary retinal disease as a group carry a very significant burden of disease. Uh, hereditary retinal disease is the leading cause of blindness in the working age population. And that reference is from a UK study from my past um, fellowship supervisor, Prof. Michaelides. Um, so while some individual diseases like excellent retinoschisis make up a small portion, there's a significant burden of disease as a whole. Um, in terms of the genetics, X-Link does in the name, and uh, there's a, a abnormal function of retinoschisin which is important for cell adhesion and Mueller cell function, but also has a role in fluid homeostasis as it acts on sodium potassium ATPase. Um, just briefly with X-linked diseases, they are a, a smaller fraction of all inherited retinal disease, but in the pediatric population, RS1 is the most common. Some more typical presentations, uh, unlike our child here, so more of a typical stellate foveal changes Interestingly, half of patients can have a very typical autofluorescence with these alternating hypo and hyperautofluorescent changes. Some can even have an apparent Robson ring and then later it can develop atrophy. And the image on the right shows progression over time with atrophy and, and pigment accumulation. We've touched on many of the exam findings, but just highlighting a few things. Um, not all patients have foveal schesis. It's reported in you know, the majority, 98%, but there is a subset that don't have foveal schesis. Uh, and peripheral schesis is found in about half and is associated with vitreous hemorrhage and RD. And those complications happen in about 5 to 20% of the, the whole cohort. Um, the fluorescine is non-leaking. We've talked on the autofluorescence findings. Electro retinography is electronegative, as we know. Uh, and just highlighting bullous retinoschisis, I think it's an important point because it highlights that not only is this a rare disease, but you can have rare presentations in, uh, within that subset. And there are a few limited series, um, you know, five or six patients in the first series and a dozen patients in the second series that report a similar presentation to our child with bullous retinoschisis. And interestingly, in their, in their series, it was associated, um, did, they did present in infancy, could be associated with vitreous hemorrhage, and it tended to resolve leaving atrophy and pigmentary change on its own. Um, but a small subset, about 11%, um, developed, have been reported to develop tractional detachments. We've talked about some of the treatment aspects here. Uh, highlighting carbonic anhydrous inhibitors can have some anatomic improvement, but modest improvement in vision. And that there are two ongoing uh, gene therapy trials. Uh, both are intravitreal delivery to avoid the risk of retinal detachment uh, with subretinal delivery in this particular subset of patients. Uh, and the first is that six month good safety data. And the second, the NEI study has showed some early visual improvement and improvement in multifocal ERG, but limited structural improvement. Interestingly, they've had some inflammatory complications, and due to the intravitreal delivery, there have been antibodies to the, the host AEV vector. The effect of this on the efficacy and transduction is, is uncertain, and that's distinct from subretinal delivery where there's relative immune privilege. Now, the focus here is on the, the surgical side, and I think this is, um, you know, one of the honest parts of pediatric retina work that Dr. Curtis does at Sick Kids is that it's quite challenging to find a kind of consensus guideline or approach to these kind of patients. Having looked through surgical retina texts and different papers, there's a number of different uh, techniques and approaches reported. Um, the surgical indications are listed here, you know, progressive schesis, vitreous hemorrhage, and retinal detachment, uh, most commonly regotogenous and less commonly as in our case, uh, tractional. Um, surgical options, uh, traditional or, or early reports reported resection of the skidic cavity, with the justification of an absolute scotoma in that area anyways, but that carries a risk of proliferation with the anterior leaflet. 
Um, and that's less commonly done now. And uh, other surgical techniques have been reported. Focus um, on our case, just to kind of show um, a surgical approach used here. So the surgical credit here is to, to Wei Wei and, and Dr. Curtis. Uh, so this child had a lens sparing 23 gauge vitrectomy. Um, the first kind of step is to um, do a limited core and then elevate the posterior hyaloid. You can see triamcinolone used here to assist with that. And you can see that it's quite adherent, um, but with a few, a few, a few attempts uh, able to elevate the posterior hyaloid here. Once some elevation is started, this is propagated superiorly and inferiorly. The other particular challenge is not only the adherent hyaloid in this young patient, but also elevating the hyaloid over this detached elevated retina and, and quite adherent in that area as well. So this is attempted initially with the cutter and uh, with some lim limited success and subsequently with the end grasping forceps with tangential force, we can see that it um, is dissected nicely here. And this is kind of propagated perfectly as far as possible. Interesting, Paul, it looks like there's a macular hole there as well, but <clears throat> there wasn't one post-operatively, so that was reassuring. There probably was a macular hole there that closed um, the gas <laughs> tamponade. Um, so also use the, tine, the diamond dusted tano scraper just to get any other residual epiretinal proliferation. A careful scleroderma depressed exam didn't reveal any breaks. So generally, we would either drain through a break or create a retinotomy. Uh, and relatively unique in this situation, we were able to avoid those um, given the absence of a break and use an expansile concentration of gas more as a precaution. And uh, it's done quite well. Great. Uh, so these are the post-operative photos here. You see good resolution of the detachment. Um, the vision is stabilized at 2400, but limited by macular atrophy. And references there, and I'll pass it back to Dr. Curtis. Thanks, Paul. That was uh, that was great. I'm I'm always um, you know we, we excellent retinoschisis is not that um, is not that rare. I imagine. Uh, many of you have some patients in your practice uh, with X-linked retinoschisis, but I'm always amazed at the, um, you know, the spectrum of findings in, in retinoschisis. You know, there are patients that, you know, have virtually, you know, that present quite late because they have very mild, um, limited foveal schesis. And then there are patients with these, you know, terrible, um, sometimes regmatogenous retinal detachments and PVR that are very hard to, uh, very hard to fix. Um, and this is um, this is a boy who had a you know re relatively he's a he's actually a wonderful he's actually a wonderful kid that doesn't complain he doesn't you know he just goes on his way plays soccer pretty actively he's, he has excellent retinoschisis and he has five sisters so um, so at least some of them are um, will be carriers and will likely have sons but they've chosen um, or I think the parents have chosen for them not to have genetic t testing of the Sisters, so that's another that's another interesting um, element to inherited retinal diseases: the choice um, and the implications of of um, genetic testing. And I, Elise, you're still um, you're still on the panel. I, you know, I'm I'm very excited about uh, these gene therapy approaches that are that are coming. You know, I was hoping for these rounds. I know I knew about these rounds a long time in advance, and we have approval for. Luxterna, which is um, a gene therapy for Lieber's congenital amaurosis. We, we've had that for six months, but we're still waiting on reimbursement. I was hoping to present at least one case of gene therapy, um, but we have, I think we're close, we're closer, but we're not there yet. So um, I'm excited about the prospect of gene therapy for X-linked retinoschisis uh, as well. Elise, do you, do you wanna comment your, um, you're on mute if you're, if you're talking already, um, but maybe she stepped. Uh, maybe she stepped away. Um, anyway, that was great. Uh, that was a great presentation, Paul. Thanks for uh, for putting that all together, and thanks Weiwei. I think Weiwei put the early years part uh, of this case together. Um, so let's move on to the um, to the last case. So Carol's going to present. The last case. So this is a um, this is a case that's actually mostly been managed by 
um, Camiar, and we thank uh, thank Camiar for his input into this case. is another very um, complex uh, case. So uh, why don't you take it away, Carol? Uh, thank you, Dr. <laughs> Curtis. Uh, um, so my name is Carol, and the case I'm going to present is the use of parcel line of vitrectomy for a dislocated d graft. So this is a uh, one of the more one well, most interesting cases I've had the uh, opportunity to uh, learn about, and I really thank Dr. Curtis for allowing me to present it as well, Dr. Mirskandari, for guiding me to some of the steps that led up to this. This is a case is a battle with lots of setbacks and triumphs throughout. We have to start at about four months of uh, age for a four-month-year-old girl that has a case of severe anterior dysgenesis. As you can see, she has type 2 Peters anomaly bilaterally. And importantly, on the right, um, although her corneal parameters uh, are appear normal, um, she had a total retinal detachment in the right and a non-recordable VEP. On the left, she had a recordable VEP, um, but as you can see, complete conjunct Stabilization of the cornea um, and vascularization. Um, and so this was the eye that was chosen to, uh, to try and um, restore some uh, vision. Uh, however, as you can see, this was already complicated by the fact that this eye was developing glaucoma with increased corneal diameter uh, thinning of the cornea as well as increased axial length. So the, so the initial surgery was, the purpose was to try and control the intraocular pressure as well as to perform a corneal transplant in a simple limbal epithelial transfer from right to left. So the first surgery was um, cyclodestruction of about three o'clock hours as well as non valve insertion. And about one week after there, there was uh, a full thickness corneal transplant with simple limbal epithelial transplantation of about two o'clock hours from the right eye to the left eye, spread around all the, uh, the limbus, followed by amniotic membrane transferred, um, insertion of a bandage contact lens as a temporary trisorophy. And as you can see here, the outcome was excellent. Um, this is a case that's now accepted in press and will be coming out. So if you wanna read the full details, but this allowed also to visualize the posterior pole and reveal the morning glory disc anomaly. So what happened next? There was a few surgeries, um, uh, there was a few events. So first um, were an Ahmed valve revision and trying to control the IOP. This was also accompanied by a lensectomy at about 11 months, 11 months of age. And then about nine months after the corneal transplant, there was a first episode of graft rejection, initially treated and reversed with drops. Um, unfortunately, five months after that, graft edema developed with increased corneal thickness, decreasing IOP, as well as you can see here with the red arrow, re formation of a retrocorneal fibrotic membrane. And here with the uh, yellow uh, arrow, you can see here, that's the omit, uh, omit tube there. So it was unclear whether this was due to endothelial failure versus rejection, but the plan was to proceed with a DSAC. So this was uh, done about three months after that. An anterior vitrectomy was performed, a membranectomy was performed, five millimeter trough line with suture pull, pull through, and um, um, graft was secured subconjunctively. About um, intracanal air was um, um, uh, was injected, and the patient remained face up in the recovery room for about two hours. However, two days after an EUA, well, can I just cornea was. You tell, I mean, I, I know I had to look this up because I didn't really know what a DSEC was. Um, you cornea folks have so many acronyms that um, I can never keep track of them. Can you, um, you just take a, a minute to tell us what a DSEC is? Sure. Uh, so this is one of the uh, uh, one of the corneal transplant procedures that is aimed at busting the decimate, it's sort of the very uh, uh, basically aimed at replacing the decimase membrane and endothelial cells to try and um, deal, to try and basically um, restore endothelial function and um, to try and ultimately dehydrate the cornea and um, 
resolve the corneal edema. Um, and so this, uh, this would be prepared from a donor um, and uh, placed underneath the transplant, the, the full thickness corneal transplant here. Um, so to, in order to keep the graft uh, from detaching, typically air is injected underneath the graft and the patient is typically instructed to lie face up. Um, however, in this case, this positioning apparently was difficult according to the patient's parents. And two days after on examiner anesthesia, cornea was again, very edematous as you can see here, and there was no DSA graft visualized. So in this patient, where did the DSEC graft go without, with the history of lensectomy, it probably slowly slipped down into the vitreous cavity. So there's a few cases published of, um, you know, what to do when this happens. So first of all, DSEC dislocation occurs at a fairly high rate. Uh, however, most cases can be repaired either by injecting more air, encouraging proper positioning, um, but in the cases that it does kind of fall through, for example, here is a DSAC graft that's kind of starting to fall through. This is a DSAC graft that's visualized uh, with B scan in the posterior uh, segment. Um, typically, it reads to proliferative vitreal retinopathy very quickly and can lead to retinal detachment. So, through various case reports and case series, you can see that the outcomes are pretty, uh, uh, the consequences can be fairly significant. You get, you can get a total retinal detachment within one to two days. You can also get rapid immobilization of this corneal graft when, and with the retina. And in this case series, all cases of proliferative retinopathy had various sizes of RD. Um, in a different case series, about, about eight cases, uh, about two developed in a retinal detachment and one had um, developed epiretinal membrane. And in sort of one of the later published commentaries is, is the most important factor when this happens is urgent retrieval of the graft because uh, in an attempt to prevent uh, proliferative vitreal retinopathy. So in this case, this urgent, we cannot wait for a repeat corneal transplant. This is also complicated by the fact that this is a small eye. It's got an opaque cornea and there's no temporary keratoprosthesis that is small enough to fit. So visualization in the surgery is very difficult. So a decision was made to proceed with an endoscopic approach to a 23 uh, gauge cannula, which is also complicated by, which makes the situation complicated by, uh, uh, by not allowing any stereoscopy. So I'm going to, play the video and Dr. Curtis, if you would like to. Yeah, sure. So this is a, you know, a very small, a very abnormal microphthalmic eye. So we, um, we make our approach very close uh, to the limbus. So we, you know, I'm often amazed by how good the view is with a biome, even through relatively op opaque anterior segment, but that wasn't the case here. So we had to use this endoscopic approach. And as Kirill pointed out, it's one thing to do a vitrectomy with the endoscope. It's not that complicated. You, you can see the shadow of your endoscope on the retina, so you know how close you're getting. Um, but it's another thing to try and pick something up um, from the vitreous cavity. It's, it's amazing how useful stereo vision is. Um, so this is an edited video, of course, um, but we tried um, multiple times to grab this um, to grab this graft and it proved more difficult than um, I had anticipated. But of course, with the, with the art of video editing, you'll see it looks like it was no problem at all. Um, but it was probably our best approach. You know, often we do cases like this with a temporary keratoprosthesis, prosthesis and the view with it through a temporary keratoprosthesis prosthesis is, is usually fantastic. Um, but this eye was so small and there's no temporary keratoprosthesis that's small enough to, uh, to make this work. Plus, um, uh, Camiar didn't feel that it was, uh, it was a good time to repeat the, uh, the PKP. 
So we do our, we're doing our vitrectomy and you see that graph floating around. I think I was also surprised by how thick it was. Um, but you can see we've, we've have some difficulty grabbing it, but we grab it finally um, and are able to remove it. And like many of our surgeries at SickKids, we often do this in tandem with, uh, with our colleagues from other services. So Cami are uh, fortunately stepped in to help with, uh, with the wound closure, which I think um, took a considerable amount of time until it was, uh, until it was airtight. Um, and so the hope was that um, the eye would have some time to heal and um, that a, a repeat transplant could be attempted down, uh, down the road. So you can see there, it's quite the extensive closure. Thank you, uh, thank you Dr. Curtis. Um, so what was the outcome? So initially the eye was complicated with the wound leak that settled. However, hypotony did not resolve. Looking through the chart, there was a brief retinal detachment and cordial effusion that resolved, but otherwise no cyclic membrane, no cyclic dialysis cleft. However, in most recent follow-up, the eye is now with Isico. The right eye still has light perception. The left eye is no light perception. The graft is edematous. The cornea is completely conjunctivized, uh, conjunctivalized. And now the most recent exam actually shows vitreous opacity suspicious for the. So unfortunately, despite all of this um, effort to try and uh, uh, restore vision to the left eye, um, it, uh, you know, probably was too much, uh, um, too much to, uh, to really overcome. Thank you very much for uh, this, uh, the opportunity to present this case. Um, very interesting uh, journey with uh, multiple surgeries and uh, very complicated uh, retinal uh, uh, surgery. So, Kirill, did you come across anything, if it had been just a decimase membrane as opposed to um, a DSAC with some stromal tissue, uh, would it have been safer to leave it behind in the vitreous or it's... I mean, that's an interesting question. I, you know, um, so Camiar came to me with this, uh, with this patient and I... Um, I, I kind of thought the same way. I thought, well, it's a piece of cornea. It's, you know, like it just, it's going to float around. What's, uh, what's the big deal. But um, there, you know, there's a, you know, a handful of, of papers in the literature as um, Carol pointed out that showed that these are, these cause significant, you know, proliferative vitreo retinopathy and retinal detachment, you know, many of, many of which if, when they were left behind um, couldn't be fixed. So, um, and of course this was the child's only eye and um, so we uh, went after it with some urgency, um, but I agree. I was surprised to see that, but, but the, literature, the literature clearly points out that if you leave these behind, um, bad things happen. And the retinal detachments that occur can be complicated to, to fix. I mean, well, the, the fortunate thing that this is a child with morning glory disc anomaly. So these cavitary disc anomalies are, are at very high risk, you know, you know, despite of everything for the development of retinal detachment. So, you know, we were, we were lucky at the outset that there was no retinal detachment present, but certainly we didn't want to leave it behind and wait for that to, uh, wait for that to happen. Um, hey, uh, John, I have a question about DMEC. So the only issue with this really is that um, it's very hard to do a DMEC in a, a faking eye. It's very hard to unfold it um, in the eye uh, when there's no support behind it. And uh, these are very unusual eyes uh, with um, tubes in as well. So it, it just, uh, it's very difficult to um, actually put a DMEC in and unfold it and put it in the right place. Um, but I suspect if you could, it, it wouldn't matter as much if you left it in the vitreous. I think uh, with these eyes, it's just uh, very unusual. And one of the issues with this case is that the peripheral retina, uh, peripheral cornea rather, um, I don't know if you saw one of the slides, it's actually about only 350 microns thick. So I think that was part of the issue with the um, difficulty suturing it and, you know, 
closing the, the ports just was surprisingly impossible because it was going through a 350 micron. So as soon as you put suture in, something else around it started leaking. So I think it was a it was an issue at first, but these guys and uh, these eyes just uh, just give up. And the saddest thing about the case is that this uh, this kid had about maybe 15 months of you know relatively good vision for what's achievable, and the parents are totally devastated that it's gone now, and they they can tell the difference. Although we would have thought the vision was maybe just I don't know hand movements or counting fingers at best, even even when the cornea was perfectly clear and the lens was perfectly clear. Um, but that means a lot to a child that can move around and play, whereas when they lose that, the parents can really tell the difference. So it's very, very sad. And, you know, these eyes just uh, very impossible. Um, and, uh, you know, I think uh, in hindsight, the, the easiest thing would have been to just do a PK in the first place, as opposed to try and do a VSEC. Um, but the first PK was, was very good. There was really um, very good uh, astigmatism with it. So trying to do a DSEC underneath sounded like a good idea um, because we do a suture pull through technique. I think just to answer some of Peter's questions, so you put a, a, su a, a suture pull through technique, which um, I think uh, I, I then you suture underneath the conch to try and hold it in place. And I learned this from David Rootman when he was uh, doing some of the cases. Um, and I think the problem is that the suture broke. Um, so uh, it, it's just uh, a multiple bad luck sessions. Um, and it's, a, it's very sad. I don't know if any of the cornea people had a comment to make, but uh, I don't know what else uh, one could do. <laughs> it puts, um, I think, sorry, just to go back to the question, uh, these kids don't position. As soon as they're up from the anesthesia, they're wiggling and they're running. So unless you keep them on the GA for 48 hours, they're not going to do head. The pop position for you and that's another sad thing so i think pk would have on hindsight maybe been more secure for this kid challenging case from the get-go though terrific well i think um i don't know amandeep if you want to you want to um say that take the say the last words well, I would like to congratulate everyone on a great, great um, rounds. Um, the presentations were excellent. The videos were great. So thank you guys for uh, sharing the wonderful world of pediatric retina and cornea. And I'll allow John to close out the rounds for this week. Yes, thanks. <clears throat> thanks again very much, Dr. Curtis and your team. Uh, in your... <clears throat> usual self-deprecating manner. You referred to this rounds as the fringe, but we really know that you're on the cutting edge here. This is really cutting edge, uh, fantastic ophthalmology. It's amazing to see. And one of the things I like best about these rounds is we get to see what our colleagues do. Uh, sometimes we just really don't know what you do when you go down to sick kids. So it's really fascinating to see this in the video. So thank you very, very much for showing us all that. We will see everybody next week for um, the next rounds, which is on low vision. Thanks again, everybody have a good weekend. Thanks. Thanks to all the presenters. You guys did a great job. Thank you. Yes. Bye, guys. Bye.